Good evening. Welcome to the Center for Global Humanities. Um, my name is Anwar Majid. I'm the director of this center. I'm assisted by some great colleagues that are around the room. And tonight we have the great pleasure of introducing Robert Alex Alexander to this uh, audience. Uh, he's a professor of political science at Ohio University, Ohio Northern University, sorry. He teaches a variety of courses in American politics. <clears throat> Dr. Alexander has been recognized for his teaching through numerous teaching awards. He has published two books examining the role of interest groups in, America, in the American political system <clears throat> and two books examining the Electoral College. His pioneering research on the presidential electors has produced new insights on these mysterious yet important political actors. His most recent book examines how the Electoral College performs relative to norms of representation. Uh, Alexander is a frequent contributor to media outlets having been interviewed in hundreds of instances by print, television, and radio. He has appeared on C-SPAN, MSNBC, and NPR's Day to Day. He is a frequent contributor to CTV Canada and has been cited by media throughout the world. And just before this uh, reception, I was talking to him, and I learned he's just published an op-ed piece in the Cleveland Plain uh, Dealer. Uh, it's titled, Teaching impeachment in an age of poor civic literacy. So, uh, and, uh, so I'm looking forward to the lecture and also to the Q&A. So please help me welcome Rob to the podium. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I could probably go on about impeachment all night, too, as, as probably you could, too, but uh, okay. <laughs> but I think we're going to do the Electoral College instead. Um, I, I really am very excited to be here. Uh, uh, this is my first time in Maine. I have to tell you that uh, I've, uh, I've been sending photographs to my wife, who's back home, who can't make it, and we're definitely going to be back here. So it's a lovely, lovely place. So. Thank you. Now I feel like a comedian, you know. It's Maine in the house, all right. <laughs> uh, I, I wanna do several things. It's, it's really hard to pack all of the things that I wanna discuss tonight into about 40 minutes or so, but I'll do my best. You'll get your money's worth, that's for sure. Uh, I wanna <laughs> tell you a few things. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the, the Electoral College itself is, is probably one of the most controversial institutions uh, in, the, in the Constitution. Uh, there have been over 800 proposals to amend or abolish it, uh, more than any other feature uh, that, that is listed in the Constitution. And that only uh, accounts for those things at the, at the national level, does not account for things at the state level, like district election that you have here in Maine, for instance. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about that and, and kind of begin in that conversation uh, Alexander Hamilton, when he was selling the Electoral College, uh, talks about it and says that if the manner of selecting the president be not perfect, it is at least excellent. <laughs> so I think that there, he, he might have uh, a, a few critics out there uh, from that perspective today. The other thing that I want to point out is that uh, the Electoral College really isn't a place. I mean, there, are pla there is a place uh, in each state capital uh, where electors cast their Electoral College votes. But the Electoral College is really a process. And that's something that we really need to understand. It's not one thing that makes up the Electoral College, which can really complicate what the Electoral College is. And so I wanna take you through some of those things uh, this evening. Uh, a little bit about the, the background and how I even started doing any examination of the Electoral College itself. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was a graduate student, I had thought of, I had a professor come to me and say, hey, let's, let's do a little research on who the electors are, the people that you and I actually choose when we're choosing our president and vice president of the United States. There had been no research on that. We, we kind of took a look at uh, what had been written about them, and maybe two paragraphs had been written about electors, uh, but, but very little as far as um, true quantifying research of, of electors. So uh, we, we, we started that project, but that professor left. And, uh, and so we never, we never finished it. This was probably 1998. Um, I know it's hard to believe I'm that old, but yes. 
Uh, in any event, when I arrived at Ohio Northern University, I was looking for a project that we could work on with our history students and our political science students, and I said, well, let's pick that project right back up. And so we did. And we, we surveyed members of the Electoral College, and we've been surveying members of the Electoral College from 2000 all the way through the 2016 election. And we've uh, been able to, to obtain the most comprehensive data set, really the only data set of who serve of electors uh, that's, that's ever been created. And uh, really, it just started out as a, a project to put a face on who electors were, like who serves. And, and the idea was maybe it would be a footnote in, in maybe in a, an American government textbook on who serve as, as electors. And now here we are, two books later, uh, and uh, the Electoral College uh, has become much more of a, of a labor of love to me than I ever would have, have, have imagined. So uh, that's a little bit of background. And, and really, the, the book Representation Electoral College, I, I had done a lot of this research on, on electors. I was talking to a colleague at the Republican National Convention uh, back in 2016. I've, I've been to both the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions. And, um, and he was saying, wow, this research that you're doing on electors is really fascinating. So for instance, uh, when we were you know, surveying the 2,000 electors, we found that there were four electors, four Republican electors, that uh, when asked, do you believe that President Bush was elected legitimately, two of them said no, and two of them said that they weren't sure. Okay, so that's 99% of Republican electors thought he was elected legitimately, that's great. But what we understand is that these electors are real people who actually have to cast a ballot. And they actually vote about a month after you and I vote. And what we found was that a lot of these electors were writing in their surveys, I will never serve as an elector again. I received death threats. Uh, I received computer viruses. Uh, I was lobbied to change my vote. This was not anything that any of these folks had probably signed up to do. Now, two of those Republican electors were from Florida, right, which was a, the state that was really up for grabs there in 2000. Now, the, the really important part is that George W. Bush, we, we know that he, he lost the popular vote that year in the, in the election, but really he won the Electoral College with 271 Electoral College votes. So those four electors, you need 270 to have a majority in the Electoral College. Those four electors then become very, very important when we consider whether or not they were going to vote for George W. Bush in 2000. And nobody had done any real research on that. And we had found this out, of course, after the fact that at least four Republican electors were at least uneasy in casting their ballots for George, for George Bush back in 2000. So, I'm telling this to my, to my buddy over a, a, a glass of ale, and uh, he says, like most good ideas, he says, boy, more, most people should, more people should know about this stuff. I said, yeah, I agree. And he says, but we need to think about this, or you need to think about this a little bit more broadly, and think about it from the context of representation. And there's the idea for this particular book on representation in the Electoral College, because electors, they're one piece of that long process of the Electoral College. There's so much more uh, that goes into it. So I want to spend some time tonight kind of talking about what the Electoral College is, some of the issues uh, that, I, that I deal with in the book, some of the issues that, of course, the framers dealt with, um, and some of the things that, of course, we're, we're still struggling with today. And I hope to uh, have lots of time for questions at the end of this. So where I started was with norms of representation. Right. It's interesting, right now, there's a lot of books coming out on the Electoral College. And most of those books pick a side. Right? They're, they're, they're saying the Electoral College needs to go, we need to ditch the Electoral College, or thank God for the Electoral College. I mean, literally, you're finding uh, a number of these books coming out. I didn't take that tack. Uh, the, 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 the way that I approached it was, well, what, do, what do we want with representation? What are some norms of representation? And you see there that there are certain norms that we have. Simplicity. People should understand the electoral process by which our leaders are selected by. The Electoral College is a pretty complicated process. It's not really that simple. Uh, equality. All votes should be counted equally. Well, that could be a concern with the Electoral College, as we know, because some states have more weight than other states due to the plus two that every state gets for having members of the Senate, right? 
But if that's, the, if that's a big problem, then the Senate's a big problem. Then we'd have to get rid of the Senate too. And, and I don't think that that's really where we want to go with this either. So that's just one little issue to, to, to consider. Participation, does the electoral process encourage or discourage participation? And we're going to go through a few slides here in a bit. But there are some states, of course, you know, if, if I were teaching in a state like, I don't know, Montana, and a student asked me, well, does my vote count? Does my vote matter in the Electoral College? It'd be hard to tell them, yeah. We know how Montana's going to vote right now. We're, we're pretty sure, at least, right? In a state like Ohio, it's a little bit different. A state like Maine that has district representation, that, that adds a, another complexity to, to the issue. Legitimacy. And this has become one of my most important issues that I think is really important to consider when we're thinking about representation. Legitimacy is that willing acceptance that those in power have a right to their position. How much do people believe that the person that is selected is the rightful heir in that position? We could be looking at an autocratic regime, and if that's the way that the autocratic regime is, and it's a legitimate means, it's a legitimate means. Here we're looking at this republic, the United States of America. So the Electoral College, I would suggest, or we're going to take a look at, complicates legitimacy when we do see some divergence between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. Then we look at governance. Does the, does the system help one govern? Does it help put people's wishes into, into public policy once they win an election? That's, of course, pretty important. Then inclusiveness. Do people feel included in that process. This is a, an issue that the framers were really dealing with. They wanted a, a process that helped for broad participation, that most everybody felt like that they had a kind of a national uh, figure. Of course, they also tried to balance that with federalism. And then feasibility. The, the issue of feasibility speaks to if there's going to be a change in that process, is it a feasible change? Are you, so somebody asked me during our reception about, uh, you know, the National Compact, right? And so Maine has kind of gone back and forth on the National Compact. And this issue of the National Compact, is it a feasible change to kind of circumvent the Electoral College to this National Interstate Vote Compact? That's a big question. Is a constitutional amendment, is that feasible? Is that something we can actually do? So if, it, if it's not, then maybe we need to have a different conversation, right? So... The framers were dealing with many of the same issues. This is not like we just came up with these things. And so they, they, when, they when they got together in Philadelphia, they, they really did struggle with this issue, but it really wasn't something that was at the, at the forefront of their minds either. And the odds on favor for much of the convention was actually that uh, the, the United States Congress would select the president. That was pretty much what was going on throughout most of the, of, of the Constitutional Convention. But that became a problem when they realized that could be a separation of powers issue. So they, they started to kind of think about different ways that they could get around that. Then they thought, well, what about state legislatures? Let's recognize federalism. One of the concerns there is that the state legislatures determined who the president would be was a concern over favorite sons. Right? So they started to think, well, what else could we do? They actually talked about a national popular vote. So it's not like a national popular vote wasn't something that was on the minds of the, of the framers. They, they talked about that as well, but they thought, you know, are, are, are people able to do that? Are they capable of doing that? Right? And so they were concerned about that, as well as the, the, the fact that, you know, they were worried that most populated states, does this sound familiar, would trample the rights of the less populated states, urban areas over rural areas. So that was another argument that they had uh, even back then. So what they did was they determined uh, to, to say, let's, let's kind of have a Frankenstein's monster of all three of these things. And, uh, and the, so they combined the House and Senate representation. So this notion of saying, how do we uh, allay the concerns of the less populated states? Uh, and one of the things that you saw was less populated states kind of um, joining coalitions with slaveholding states, right? Because of the concern over population. Um, so that was one of the things that we saw there. And uh, we saw state-by-state state elections. So as we know today, the Electoral College really isn't a national popular vote, but a collection of state-by-state state elections. And then we saw independent electors, something that Alexander Hamilton spent a lot of time discussing in the Federalist Papers, that these electors would be wise, judicious individuals who would use their discretion 
right? Well, that's not exactly what we have today. So any conversation that we have about the Electoral College must acknowledge that the Electoral College of today is not the Electoral College that the framers devised. The Electoral College that the framers devised fell apart pretty quickly. In fact, uh, the original Electoral College, there was no distinction between presidential vote and vice presidential vote. And so whoever the top two vote getters were, were the president and vice president. Can you imagine that today? Yeah, that would make, a sh that would make The Apprentice look really uh, like not that much of a show, right? Um, and so the, the emergence of party of political parties, which the framers did not totally foresee, uh, the emergence of political parties there, they started running party tickets. And when uh, we had Jefferson and Burr running in a party ticket, running together, all of their electors voted for, for, for each of them. So they tied in the Electoral College. So neither of them got a majority in the Electoral College. It was then thrown to the House of Representatives contingent election. I think it was 36 ballots later, you know, Aaron Burr did not just say, well, okay, yeah, Thomas, you go ahead and become president. Uh, and interestingly, Alexander Hamilton makes his way back into presidential politics here. And even though Hamilton and Burr had been business partners uh, long ago, and, and, and Hamilton and Jefferson did not really like each other either. They had a lot of differences in principles. Um, Hamilton said, well, you know, at least Jefferson has principles. I don't know about Burr. And so he tried to, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, lobby several folks in Congress to select uh, Jefferson, which they did, ultimately. That then precipitated the, the 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So really, within almost a decade of, of its passage, the Electoral College underwent a fundamental change that has changed it forever. So the, the, the fact that now you have to distinguish your presidential vote versus your vice presidential vote makes a huge difference in how the Electoral College operates. It is not the Electoral College of the Founding Fathers. In fact, the Founding Fathers thought that after George Washington, 19, then there's a quote right out of the, the, uh, uh, the book, uh, 19 out of 20 elections would be settled by the House of Representatives because nobody would be able to command a majority like General Washington. So that was the original Electoral College, right? Uh, the emergence of the winner-take-all. And we're going to take a look here at some maps here in a moment. But the winner-take-all means essentially if you win a state by one vote, you get all of those electoral college votes. That really, really benefits the two-party system. This is a major benefit to the two-party system. This is a choice. This was not mandated. This is not in the Constitution. This is a choice by political parties. So the emergence of the winner-take-all as opposed to some form of proportional representation or district representation really, again, changed the landscape of the Electoral College. And then the emergence of obedient electors. No longer were electors chosen for their discretion, their judgment, their ability to, to make decisions in, the, in, in, in a complicated and uncertain environment. No. They were chosen to be obedient. Their fealty to the candidates was what, was, what, was what mattered. We did not want electors who went rogue. So it's interesting today, an elector who does not vote how they're expected to vote is referred to as a faithless elector. Okay, so a faithless elector, which you almost had in Maine in 2016, uh, is, is kind of seen with, with scorn and, and, and um, disgust. Well, electors that would go faith faithless would like to say, no, we're actually being faithful to the original vision of electors. And I'm going to spend some time chatting about that, too. See, I keep throwing things to the future, right? Keep you with me. So maps. Oh, yeah, maps. Maps can clarify or maps can obscure. Now, these are all maps of the 2016 election, but they all look really different from one another. Uh, the, the two maps on the left are really emphasizing a lot about land, the, the relationship to land, to people. Now, it's worth noting that uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice once said that, you know, land doesn't vote, trees doesn't vote, don't vote. It's people that vote, right? People are represented, you know, by the, you're representing people, not land. And so the, the maps on the left kind of speak to that a little bit. 
uh, putting some context into uh, the outputs of, of 2016. The maps on the right, uh, kind of focusing on that winner take all component as well. Right? So depending on the map that you wish to use, you can tell lots of very different stories about what actually happened in 2016. And anybody that's on social media probably has seen at least one version of these maps uh, at some point. So in 2016, and this is very similar to a lot of other elections, we find that 94% of all campaigning took place in just 12 states. Now, one of the arguments at the founding, but also today, is that, well, without the Electoral College, less populated states would be ignored. If you look at this map, you can see that less populated states are being ignored under the Electoral College. They're currently not being visited or courted during the general election campaign. Today, Yes, we see candidates are going to places like Mississippi and they're going to places like Alabama and they're going to places like California. They will not go to those places because it's primary season, right? But they will not go to those places during the general election campaign after the conventions. And this was true in 2000. It's true in 2016. And it's true in, in, in these other races that maybe weren't so close. And then again, you see 70% of campaigning took place in just six states. Ohio, my state, is, is one of those prize jewels. Uh, we are actually um, perhaps at a crossroads. Uh, some are looking at Ohio now and saying, well, Ohio's already in the Republican column. Is Ohio a, still a swing state? Uh, that's, a, that's a big issue or a big question mark for, for my fellow Buckeyes. When I gave a speech uh, on the Electoral College in 2016, uh, about a week before the election, I was out in California and uh, in the audience, they said, well, what's so special about Ohio? You know, we're, we're voters too. And I said, I, I, I don't disagree. You are voters too. But we know that Hillary Clinton's going to win in California. We don't know who's going to win in Ohio. And that's ultimately what makes a swing state. So if there's uncertainty over the outcome, that's where we find a swing state. So that's going to take out many of the most populated states. It's going to take out many of the least populated states. Uh, but it also takes out a number of states somewhere in between as well. So these battleground states or these swing states uh, become the crown jewel that candidates literally are crisscrossing. I, I mean, I'm, I am serious. In Ohio, they are literally are going back and forth on I-75, uh, waving, waving hello to one another. Maybe not. Maybe that wasn't the gesture. I don't know. Um, <laughs> ha ha, right? Okay. So I, I know that there's a lot of, lot of data right here. Uh, what I want to really kind of get across here is that uh, most elections, because of that winner take all, so let me kind of go back here real quick. So in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Florida, those states were decided by like 1%. Okay, 1% difference in those states. Yet, whoever wins those states gets 100% of the vote, right? So it doesn't really accurately show what happened in those states. So if it's just red or it's blue, it's telling us, well, you won the state, you get all of those votes. That's, that's one way to do an election. Maine has chosen to do it a little bit differently, right? So there are, there, are, there, are, there are some issues here that we need to, to talk about. So what it often masks is how close elections actually are. In fact, 50% of all uh, presidential elections have come down to 75,000 votes or less. That's it. Okay, 75,000 votes or less. 40% of all presidential elections have come down to 30,000 votes or less. And 20%, one out of five elections, presidential elections, have come down to 10,000 votes or less. Now, we already know that we found that there are a number of misfire elections. They're, they're this, not my term. I, I'm using that from somebody else. A misfire election is where uh, a candidate loses the popular vote but wins the electoral college. There's this divergence. Uh, 
we know that's happened 10% of all presidential elections. So one out of 10 elections has, has resulted in a misfire. I kind of want to point something out here. Uh, in, uh, in 1976, in doing some research, one of the things Bob Dole, Senator Bob Dole, who ran for president, uh, he was a vice presidential uh, nominee in 76. He said that uh, in, in the 76 election, and this was under congressional testimony, he said, you know, we were shopping, excuse me, looking for electors in Ohio who might consider voting for us. So the, 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 the race in Ohio was extraordinarily close in 1976. And, and we have congressional testimony from one of the candidates saying, yeah, we thought about trying to flip presidential electors in order to win the presidency. Okay. So again, the Electoral College, it's a process. There's a lot going on right here. So let me just kind of take a look at 2016. Now, there were over 136 million people that voted in the 2016 election. If 95,000 people changed their mind, now, change their mind. Really? People are going to change their mind? Some studies have found that 20% of Americans changed their mind in the last month of, a, of an election. And as many as 4% changed their mind the day of an election. Now, I want you to think about that. Now, most people can look at Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and it's not about public policy differences. It's not about the amount of information that they've gathered. They literally, probably, don't know very much about these candidates at all. If you're sitting there and it's a coin flip on election day between Clinton and Trump, you really haven't been paying much attention, okay? But ultimately, again, Many of these races, many of these states were decided by 1%. And yet, again, 4% of Americans are unsure on the day of the election. One of the things that we found in 2016 was that those undecided or those late deciding voters broke two to, two to one for Donald Trump. He picked up a lot of those late deciding voters in 2016. So coming back to this, this slide, Clinton actually wins pretty big. If 95,000 people out of that, 136 million people changed their mind and voted for her. It's a very small percentage, right? And, and there we're looking at Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, Pennsylvania, okay? The differences in those states, all about 1%. Clinton wins a squeaker if just 67,000 people change their mind and vote for her rather than Donald Trump. Now, that would be 0.00049%, blah, blah, blah. This would also assume that all Democratic electors remained faithful. Five were not, okay? And in fact, one elector from the state of Washington said in the days prior to the, to the election, and again, most expectations were that Hillary Clinton was gonna win. And he said, in advance of the election, I hope I'm the elector that costs Hillary Clinton the election. I don't believe in Hillary Clinton. I think, his words, I think she's a corporate shill. And so I would love to be the one to deny her the presidency. That elector, she did win the state of Washington, and that, and that particular elector is the elector that voted for Faith Spotted Eagle. Faith Spotted Eagle actually has an electoral vote for the presidency from 2016, okay? So that requires that all electors remain faithful. Okay, now if just 45,000 vote, uh, voters change their mind, Clinton, uh, and, and vote for Clinton over Trump, would have a 269 to 269 tie. Wouldn't that be fun? That means neither re re receives a majority, if indeed every elector were to vote as they're supposed to vote. Now, I, at this point, let me point out, Donald Trump had two electors, two Republican electors, step aside in advance of the Electoral College vote rather than not vote for him. So there were two Republican electors, one in Georgia and one in Texas, who said in advance, I will not vote for Donald Trump. 
And so they were summarily, one was removed, asked nicely, please step aside. And the other one said, I can't vote my conscience, so I'll step aside. So there, 269, 269 tie, which then goes to the House of Representatives, where each state gets to vote as a, as a group, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, if you're in Montana, that one member of Congress is the Montana vote. If you've got 53 members of the House of Representatives in California and there's more Republicans in the House than, than there are Democrats, then California is going to vote for the Republican. Even, even so, even if we had one, you know, uh, California and Montana's vote being completely equal in a contingency election, really throwing a lot of power than to the least populated states. So that didn't happen, but some looked for it to happen. If just 27,000 people change their mind, so here we're just looking at uh, uh, Michigan um, and Pennsylvania, 27,000 people change their mind. Uh, Trump wins by a very, very small margin, 270 electoral college votes, right at the margin. So all of these maps are telling you like how close the election actually was. It was extraordinarily close. So not only did Clinton kind of win this popular vote, which by the way, the, the popular vote is somewhat mythical, right? Because it's not like candidates are campaigning everywhere. The popular vote would be very different. Donald Trump pointed this out. He says, I would have campaigned very differently if it were a national popular vote. He would go to California. He would, he would go to Alabama. And Hillary Clinton would probably go to Georgia or Texas, right? But that's not, that's not the state of play. So this takes me to a lot of the research that, that I've done on, on electors. Like, who are electors? These kind of mythical creatures. They are real people, right? And so here, I've, again, a lot of data there. I mean, the, the, the one column off to the far right, the citizenry, is kind of like, you and me, like what you and I look like, like what does the populace look like? And then you have 2000 electoral college, the 2004 and so on. Uh, 2008 and 2012, those are, you know, controlled by Democrats. So the Democrats won more uh, votes there in the electoral college, Barack Obama. Um, so you see some differences in some areas. Um, but one of the, a couple of takeaways when you kind of look at, well, who are electors in comparison to us? One thing is, they look a lot like Congress, okay? Now, a member of Congress can't serve as an elector. That's one of the few stipulations that the Constitution has. Again, separation of powers, okay? But they, they're, they're wider, they're far more educated, and they have a heck of a lot more money than the average Joe or Jill, okay? They're more male um, than, 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 than most of us are. In, in the Republic as well. So there's, there's some, some significant differences there. The other thing that I would point out is that Democrats and Republicans, uh, they, they tend to reward their party faithful, right? That's kind of one of the, 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 the thoughts about who electors actually are, the, the, the stalwarts of the party. And so they're re rewarded with these positions for their activity or the money that maybe they've given, right? One of the things we found is that actually half of electors don't give a dime. So it's not like they buy their way into the Electoral College. Some do. Some give hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but others give nothing. They are indeed hard party workers, and they are indeed rewarded because they know that they're going to be loyal. Right? So you do see some, some, some differences between Democrats and Republicans here. Uh, but, but generally, they look like members of Congress. They don't look like you and me. So... One of the things, and I, I pointed this out earlier, is that uh, we, we found a, 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 a behavior that, you, you, that wasn't really um, discussed before, that electors are actually lobbied, that people contact, who electors, uh, contact electors in an effort to change the outcome. Nobody had really investigated this because it was kind of an afterthought, like a vestigial organ that you don't pay attention to until the appendix ruptures. And then you go, whoa. Something's going on here. And so what we find is that, again, 2004, we didn't even ask the question in 2000. Did anybody contact you? We didn't ask that question. Nobody's going to contact it. Well, they do. So we asked that question in 2004 forward. 
And we found 29% of electors in, in, in uh, 2004 were contacted. Now, I want to point something out. In 2004, John Kerry lost the state of Ohio by 1.5%. We've already talked about, you know, 4% of people changing their mind, that kind of stuff. If John Kerry wins Ohio in 2004, he wins the Electoral College with 271 Electoral College votes, but loses the popular vote by 3 million. So we almost saw two misfire elections burning each party's candidates in consecutive elections. If we would have seen that, now of course we didn't, if we would have seen that, I think then we would have seen uh, a lot more pitchforks uh, descending upon state capitals to, to change or alter the Electoral College in some way. But we didn't. Well, every single, every single Republican elector in the state of Ohio was lobbied to have their vote changed in 2004 because folks didn't want to give up on that belief that John Kerry could still be president of the United States. And again, the Constitution permits that, right? I mean, we are not the ones voting. We're voting for electors. Now, most everybody in here, most everybody across the United States never sees the elector's name. It used to be that elector's names were listed on ballots, and you could literally cross party lines and vote for electors of either party. You could do that. There was a time when you could do that. Now we've moved to the short ballot where it, most states it will say electors pledge to, and you just see Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton. If we still had a process where we saw the electors names, maybe I think there would be a better argument to say that uh, electors could vote the way that they wanted to vote. But if we don't see who their names are, we don't know exactly who they are, that seems to me to be a, a pretty fallacious argument to make. So 2008, interesting. 83%, now 83% of electors were lobbied to change their vote. What happened in 2008? Well, it's not Q&A time, right? But 2008, Barack Obama wins the Electoral College by about 100 Electoral College votes, and he wins the popular vote by 10 million votes. The outcome is not in dispute. What could people possibly be lobbying about in 2008? I'm literally asking a question now. <laughs> Does anybody have a guess? Race. Birtherism. So there were electors that were being lobbied saying Barack Obama is not an American citizen and therefore cannot be president of the United States. And many of these electors, I should share with you that uh, when you do a mail survey, so we do a mail survey, if you get 15%, you're excited. We've been getting 60% on most of these surveys. Like they want to talk. They want to tell us what's going on. Okay. Now, the, the 2016 survey, we only got 50% back, and I will get to why that's the case. I mean, they were flooded. They were inundated. Um, but we still got 50% of the electors to respond to our survey. So in 2008, one of these electors sent me some of the, the letters that they received. One letter, really would like you to think about your vote against Barack Obama. Next letter. You know, Barack Obama, some people say he's not an American citizen. Next letter. He's a Kenyan. Do not vote for him. Next letter. We will sue you if you vote for him. I mean, it just got more and more um, radical in, in, the, uh, in the letters that they received. So there was quite a bit of a, of a movement to undo maybe the popular will or at least have electors um, investigate that a little bit further. Uh, in uh, 2012, still a majority of electors were, were again lobbied uh, to change their, change their votes. Again, not, it was a closer election, but not particularly close. Now, 2016, that's, the, that's the, the crowning jewel, right? So 2016, literally the night of the election, the night of the election. Now, there's, believe it or not, there's not a lot of people that are writing about presidential electors. Like, there's me. Okay, <laughs> which makes it hard to, to, made it very hard to publish in that area initially. Now in 2016, after the election, I get a call from CNN's uh, opinion editor. Uh, he sends me an email, says, Rob, we're gonna need you. And I'm like, I'm ready coach, let's go, you know? Um, I get a call from, or I get an email from a group called the Hamilton Electors. 
Okay, and I'll say a little bit more about them as well. So suddenly, uh, I became the guy to talk to about this stuff. And, and, and I think we were, we were very much ready for this. So every single Republican elector was contacted in 2016. And in their surveys, they wrote thousands of emails. People sent me the Federalist Papers. People sent me legal briefs. People sent me all kinds of information, media information, so on, so on, so on. Voting calculus. Stories about the Russians interfering in the election. 2016, they were talking about that. Now, I'll also say that uh, the electors, mostly Democrats, but several Republicans signed on to it as well, had asked for a briefing from the National Security Council before they were supposed to cast their votes to find out about Russian interference in the election. And they cited Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers where Hamilton talks about the Electoral College's role in preventing, you ready for this, foreign interference in our presidential elections. Okay. Now, the National Security Council under the Obama administration said no. We're not going to grant you that, that hearing, which tells you a lot about at least what they thought of a presidential elector's discretion, you know, that they should indeed just stay faithful to whatever happened in the election. So uh, you see a lot of these folks, Sarah Ant Live did a skit, if you're really paying attention, Sarah Ant Live did a skit, kind of the, uh, I think it was the, the, the Love Actually, Hugh Grant, I know you're an elector, you know, that kind of thing there. So um, electors became a thing. So when CNN's uh, opinion editor reaches out to me and says, we need a piece on electors in that time period between when, when you and I vote and when they vote, which is, again, is about a month, uh, I wrote a piece kind of laying out like what, what I think electors will probably do. I said that electors will be lobbied like crazy, that uh, electors, uh, many will consider it, many will consider it, but we will probably see more uh, Democrats defect than Republicans, which is exactly what happened, okay? Now, I had, a, I had a title that was something like, you know, Mission Impossible something something. But then they, Lady Gaga and Sia and, and several other celebrities signed on to a change.com petition to have the Electoral College change their vote. So millions of people signed on to this petition, including Lady Gaga. So that got some, some media publicity. So I'm not the headline writer, they are. And they said, sorry, Lady Gaga, unseating Trump in the Electoral College is mission impossible. Not my, not my line, but thanks to that line, that article ended up trending on Apple News and my kids were like, dad, what's going on here? You know, so that was kind of cool, but anyway. So. Here is a little table on those that have considered defecting over time. And uh, kind of from 2004 to 2012, one of the things I want you to, to just kind of think about is it's about 10% of electors in any of those elections. And most of the time, it's the elector in the, in, the, in the party that lost the election. You have nothing to lose, right? But 10% of electors, that's 53 electors, Right? That's like the entire delegation of the state of California that consider, that think about not voting who they're, I mean, imagine you go to the voting booth and the precinct worker looks over your shoulder and says, nah, and they just go ahead and vote for somebody else. In many ways, that's how we're looking at it with these electors that would be faithless at least today. It does not jibe with the evolved electoral college. The original Electoral College, all for it. Not the evolved Electoral College. It's not the expectation that most people have for electors. But 10% of electors in any of these elections have thought about it. Now you go to 2016, and I mentioned those Hamilton electors. So not only was there this movement amongst the citizenry to say, oh my goodness, Donald Trump won. We're so surprised. Let's, I don't think he's the right guy. And there were even presidential candidates, Evan McMullen, for instance, so Evan McMullen, independent candidate, former Republican, uh, he was only campaigning in a couple of states, Utah in particular, and his whole goal was to just deny Trump or Clinton a majority in the Electoral College, throw the race into the Electoral College, okay, and then it, it, they, they choose from the top three candidates, and he would be the kind of the uni, unifying candidate, okay. 
and uh, to kind of heal the nation. Well, of course, Trump gets a majority. Trump wins. And yet, electors themselves, there was a Republican elector from Texas who wrote a, an opinion uh, piece in the New York Times saying, I beg of my fellow Republicans, Donald Trump is not the Republican Party. And he says, we need to, to find some kind of compromise candidate like John Kasich or like Colin Powell, okay, to, 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 be, our, to be our nominee, to be our president. And so uh, he ended up voting faithlessly. Uh, another Texas Republican also voted faithlessly, um, voting for uh, Ron Paul uh, for, for president. And so uh, uh, we, we found then that a, n a number of these electors, and several of them from Washington State and one from Colorado, who called themselves the Hamilton electors. They were using Alexander Hamilton Federal 68. And they said, look, Hamilton said, you know, we, we need to protect the republic if need be. So they're relying upon that. You saw liberal academics saying, I used to hate the electoral college, but now suddenly I think the electors were on to something. Let's go ahead and unseat the president. So, you know, kind of depending on who you are and where you stand, people saw the electoral college very differently. And I might just take one moment at this point to point out that of those 800 some proposals, Democrats right now, are really against the Electoral College, right? Like that's what you see in the media. It wasn't too long ago that Republicans had many issues with the Electoral College. So Republicans in Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, were all looking at Maine as an example and saying maybe we should go to district election for President of the United States because we seem to, like we can't win in a presidential election but we've got a lot of congressional districts in these states. So in 2000, right after the 2008 election, they thought about that, they brought it up in several of the state legislatures, it never went to a vote in those state legislatures. So Democrats and Republicans have been equal opportunity uh, uh, critics of the Electoral College. So returning back to 2016, what you see here, and I was, honestly surprised by this, 20% of Republican electors said that they gave some consideration to not voting for Donald Trump. I think they needed 37 electors to not vote for him, okay? We did see the largest contingent of faithless electors in American history in 2016, all right? And one in five Republicans, over I think two dozen Republicans that actually responded to the survey Right? Like 27 Republicans responding to the survey said, yeah, I thought about it. One even said, if somebody had done it on the East Coast, maybe I would have done it. It's, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the impeachment conversation that we're having today. Nobody wants to be the one to jump into the water first. Right? Um, so it was a, there clearly was an audience among those electors to, to change the outcome of the presidential contest in 2016. Uh, immediately after this, there were a number of states that thought about or put together binding laws, binding uh, electors to the popular vote of that state. So in Colorado, one of the electors uh, crossed out uh, the name and, and wrote for John Kasich instead. He was immediately removed and his case is now going before the Supreme Court, whether or not an elector is indeed a free agent. There was an elector in Minnesota who voted for Bernie Sanders. He then was removed and replaced. So in many of these binding states, what they do is they say, if you cast a faithless vote, you are uh, uh, basically saying you're no longer in this position anymore, okay? Now, interesting side note about Minnesota, in 2004, an elector voted for John Edwards twice, for president and for vice president. It was done in secret, so it was not a public viewing. No elector owned up to it and said, it was me, <laughs> it was a mistake, or I really wanted Edwards twice, whatever. Nobody knows. Immediately afterward, Minnesota then passed that law, which came into effect in 2016. 
the state of Washington, which had several presidential electors that were, became faithless this last election. Uh, in 1976, they had a faithless elector. And they criminalized the action by, by uh, incurring a fine for a faithless elector. In 2016, there were folks saying, I'll pay your fine. Okay, so all kinds of things uh, happening here. All right, so looking forward to 2020, uh, I've put together a couple of op-eds that I've written um, more recently. Um, one, I said we could be headed toward, again, I'm not the headline writer here. Actually, I did do the one on Texas. That, they, they, they gave me that one. Um, but we could be headed for another electoral college mess. I, I find it very difficult to see a path where Donald Trump has expanded the number of votes that he's going to win in 2020. That doesn't mean that he's, he, he can't win the electoral college. He, he very well could win the electoral college, but I find it unlikely that he could also win the popular vote. So I'm making the case that he will likely, if he finds a second term, he, it would come about in the same way that he won his first term. Now, I believe that losing the popular vote is something that has bothered President Trump quite a bit. This is one of the reasons I think he has brought up the Electoral College so frequently. Uh, and again, I think that comes back to legitimacy, a question of legitimacy. I mean, this is one of the it's a much deeper issue that I'm going to get into tonight. But this is, you know, the issue about Russian interference in the election and all that kind of stuff, too questions of legitimacy. So how we choose somebody matters. And, and in the book, uh, for those of you that have read it, you know, I, I go through these misfire presidents and you find that a lot of those presidents that, that didn't win the popular vote, George W. Bush is the only one that won re-election, right? They, most of them had a very difficult time governing. And part of that is also what was at play um, in, in the races that, that, that they ran in. So another misfire is, is completely possible. Uh, and then faithless electors, uh, big question whether or not we're going to see, you know, is this becoming more of a norm? Uh, we've seen faithless electors in like 10 of the last 18 presidential elections. So again, they're not unicorns. They're, they're real. Uh, you, you saw one in, almost one in Maine, um, who may have inspired a faithless elector in Hawaii, uh, who, who said, uh, you know, who wrote, uh, your guy in Maine, and said, you know, thank you for your courage in Maine. It gave me the courage to, to vote for, uh, I think, Bernie Sanders in Hawaii in, in that race. So um, then the emergence of Texas. Now, this was, uh, I, I wrote this piece a, a, a little bit ago, and uh, Texas has become a reliably red state, right? It's a reliably red state. Democrats haven't really competed in there, but in, the, in more recent elections, demographics have been changing. Not all swing states stay swing states, the same swing states. They change. And one of the things that we're finding is that Texas has been trending more purplish. It's not purple yet, but it's trending more purple. And, and what you can find is that if, if, if Democrats could turn Texas blue, they could win the Electoral College with 16 states. And we're talking not Ohio, not Wisconsin, not Michigan. Okay, so those really populated states. So for all of the concern that Democrats have right now about, well, the popular vote is, 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 you know, is troublesome for us, they actually could fare very well. So if they were to lock up the Electoral College with this, this hand, more than a, maybe two handfuls of states, and if they were to lock that down, it would probably be Republicans saying, whoa, this electoral college process is problematic for us. Again, we've seen this happen between the parties in the past. So when you start tinkering with things um, or you start looking, much of it depends on where you stand, right? And if you think it's benefiting you, it's okay. If you don't think it's benefiting you, it's a problem. And so, you know, when you're thinking about the electoral college and you're thinking about these issues of representation, Keep in mind those norms of representation. Ultimately, that's, I think, what, what really is important. So I, I think with that, I think that's all, I've, yeah, that's all I've got for you. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to take any questions that you might have. Well, thank you. Wow.